Can you live stream multiple cameras without a video switcher or even a video interface for your computer? In this video, I'm gonna show you how. Hello, I'm Stephen Ballast. Welcome to my channel where I explore worship technology solutions. Before I get started, if you find this video helpful and wanna see more videos about live streaming and really any live production related technology, be sure and subscribe to my channel. Also, be sure and check down in the description of this video where you'll find a lot of helpful stuff like links to the equipment I'm talking about, as well as links to my website and Facebook page where you can get in touch with me. Here on my YouTube channel, I've shown a number of different ways you can approach live streaming with different video interfaces, software, and cameras. In general, a normal live streaming system is gonna involve a video source, which could be a single camera or multiple cameras running through a switcher, and then some way to encode the video, which is where the video gets compressed to be sent out over the internet. Oftentimes, we'll use a computer with a video interface for that. And then finally, there's a live streaming service provider you send the video to, which could be a free service like Facebook and YouTube, or a paid service like Vimeo, or one of the services that caters to churches like church streaming or Sunday streams. The approach I'm about to show you in this video is a little different. We still use our streaming provider and a computer and cameras, but in between, all we'll use is a network. The nice part about it is that because it doesn't require a video switcher or a video interface, a multi-camera setup can be done pretty economically. So I think this approach could be a good solution for some people. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about using cameras that have the networking protocol RTSP built in. Usually those are security cameras, but I'm gonna show you some of the new PTZ Optics Z-Cam cameras. These cameras send out their video signal over a regular network Cat5 cable, and you can bring that video right into your computer through its network connection and into your encoding software, and even use free software like OBS where you can switch between many cameras for your live stream. An advantage of this approach is that you probably already have network cables run around your building, so you can position cameras wherever you can access your network, and you can set up your control room with your computer to control it all and live stream from anywhere that has network access as well. So now let's go through step-by-step -step how to make this work. Of course, if you haven't already, go and download and install the free program Open Broadcaster Software, or OBS. This can be run on a PC or a Mac. First of all, connecting everything up physically is pretty simple. Connect your cameras to a switch using regular Cat5 networking cables. If you have a PoE or power over ethernet capable switch, you can power the cameras through the ethernet cable as well. But if you don't, you can just use the supplied power adapter. Then to complete the system, you'll just need to have your computer connected to the same network as the cameras. Once you have everything connected, download the PTZ Optics upgrade tool, which is not only used to upgrade the camera firmware, but also to set its IP address. The IP address you set is going to depend on your network, how much access you have to configure your network, and really how network savvy you are. But let me show you what I think is the simplest way to make it work. You'll want to set the cameras to a static IP address that is in the same subnet as your computer. What that means is the first three numbers of the IP address need to be the same, and the last number needs to be unique for each device. Usually in a simple network, the router provided by your internet service provider will be acting as a DHCP server, which assigns IP addresses to devices on the network. If you can, configure the DHCP server to limit the range of the addresses it assigns in order to exclude a range of addresses that you can use for your camera. For instance, set the DHCP server to assign addresses from say 5 to 200, and then set your camera IP addresses between 201 and 250. This way, you can leave your computer set to get its IP address from the DHCP server automatically, and your cameras and computer are still gonna be on the same subnet where they can see each other. Next, we'll wanna configure a few things in each camera. So open a browser and enter the IP address of the camera. The camera will prompt you for a username and password. Both are admin. You can install the plugin in your browser and see the video feed here if you want, but I'm just gonna go to the video menu over here and let's look at some of these settings. First, select the output resolution you want to use. For a Facebook live stream, I've selected 1280 by 720, which is also the canvas size I've set in OBS. 
One thing to understand about this resolution setting here is that this only affects the resolution of the video going out over the network. It doesn't change the resolution on the SDI connection at the back of the camera. The two can actually be different. Frame rate I'll set to 30, which is the maximum we can get out of these cameras on their network connection, and it's the maximum frame rate that Facebook Live will take as well. Finally, let's talk about the bitrate setting. Just like the bitrate setting for live streaming, this is how much data the camera will use per second to send video over the network. And this setting has a lot of implications. For one, it determines the quality of the image. If you set this too low, it's going to look blocky and compressed. OBS re-encodes the video coming in for the outgoing live stream that you're sending out on the internet. The video from the camera stays on your local network and a gigabit switch will be able to handle a lot of cameras, so you'll want to keep it as high as possible to maintain the quality of the image, especially if you're recording the video. There is, however, one reason to use a lower bitrate from the camera, and that is a higher bitrate puts more processing load on your computer, which could become an issue as you add more cameras. I lowered the bitrate to 12,000 for each camera, which still produced a reasonable quality image for recording, and I was able to use this computer with an i3 processor and only 3 gigs of RAM with two cameras live streaming to Facebook at 4,000 kbps, which is the maximum bitrate Facebook will take. I ran it for over an hour and it was stable at 50% CPU usage and no drop frames the whole time. This computer would never work with a regular USB video interface like the AJA UTAP because it wouldn't be able to deal with the massive amount of data coming in from a raw video feed. I've tried it, it just doesn't work. I'm not suggesting or recommending that you use a low spec computer like this, but what I'm saying is that you can probably use a computer that you already have to start doing this. You don't necessarily need something special. So I think that's a big advantage and potential cost savings to using a system like this. By adjusting the bitrate, you can scale it to the capabilities of your computer. Do set all cameras to the same bitrate, because at least with these PTZ Optics cameras, Different bit rates created different amounts of delay in the video signal that reached the computer. For me, both cameras seem to be time aligned when I set it to the same bit rate. And we'll talk more about latency and delay in a second. I need to say that in my testing, I ran into a problem. I decided to use this approach with these two cameras to record a marriage conference we held here. And for the most part, it worked great. But a couple times I lost a camera feed in OBS. It turns out to be an issue with the way that OBS handles an RTSP source when added as a media source. If there's any glitch in the connection, it doesn't re-establish that connection to the camera. Thankfully, I did find a more reliable way to connect the cameras, and using the method I'm about to show you, I've had OBS open and the cameras stay connected for over 24 hours until I turned it off. On the computer running OBS, we're going to need to install the free program VLC. Since we're going to use the VLC source in OBS to bring in our RTSP video. And this is the workaround I used to fix the problem with the cameras dropping out. You'll need to download and install the 64 bit version of VLC on your computer. Once that's installed, in OBS, we'll create a scene for each camera. Click the plus symbol under Scenes, I'll call this Camera 1, and then under Sources, we'll add a VLC video source, and I'll name this ZCAM20X. Then in the Properties page, click the plus symbol over here on the right and select Add Path slash URL. And then enter RTSP colon slash slash, followed by the IP address of your camera, and then a colon followed by 554, which is the port that the camera is communicating on. I've played with these other options some, and to be honest, I haven't noticed much of a difference. I leave Loop Playlist checked and then select Always Play even when not visible, and that seems to work fine. Click OK, and there we have our first camera in OBS coming in over the network. I'll repeat that again for my second camera, add a scene called Camera 2, add the VLC source, enter the IP address of the second camera, and now I have two scenes in OBS. I can change which camera is active on my live stream or recording just by clicking and selecting the scene. Something you'll notice right away is that there is a significant amount of delay from what's happening on stage to when the image arrives in OBS. That's just going to be a part of life when you send video over a network. There's going to be delay. So this is not a solution you'd want to use if you ever plan to put your camera feed up on your projectors or something that is visible to people in the room. 
With both cameras set to the same bitrate and connected to the same switch, for me the two video signals were in sync. So it's actually pretty easy to sync our audio to that using the same method I've shown in one of my previous videos that shows how to sync audio and video in OBS. And speaking of audio, I'm bringing my audio into the computer through a USB audio interface. I really like this Focusrite 2i2, but if you need to, you can even use something really cheap like the Behringer UM2, and that will let you bring in a line level signal from a mixer or whatever source you have for your audio. To bring the audio into OBS, you'll go to each scene and add an audio input capture source. The first time, we'll select Create New. I'll call it 2i2 Audio and then select the Focusrite USB device. Then in the second scene, we'll select Add Existing and choose the audio source we've already created. And what you'll probably want to do is in the audio mixer, go to each scene and mute everything but the 2i2 audio source. So no matter what camera we choose in our scenes, we'll be getting audio from whatever is coming in through the audio interface. This 20X model has a zoom lens that's built in, and the zoom is something you could adjust live by installing the PTZ Optics plugin for OBS. All you do is download the zipped file from PTZ Optics, and then copy the whole folder into your OBS plugins folder. And the next time you launch OBS, it will show up here under the tools menu. That opens up this control panel that will let us connect to the camera and control its zoom. And if you have one of their PTZ cameras, you could control its pan and tilt here as well. While these cameras aren't really meant to be manned, you could theoretically connect an external monitor that has SDI inputs, and that would let an operator see the framing and then use it as a follow shot on a tripod. That's what I did when I was testing the system out at the marriage conference, and while it's not necessarily ideal, it worked fine. The fact that both these cameras have an SDI output also means that if you ever do decide to move your video system over to a hardware video switcher, these cameras will come right along with you. The VLZ cam works as a static camera. The zoom and focus on the lens is not something you'd want to be adjusting during an event. It's the kind of thing that you need to set and leave it because it's kind of fiddly. But it does have a pretty broad range of zoom, from extremely wide to close enough that you can probably frame a wide static shot in just about any room or use it as a lockdown close-up camera on your stage. The 20X camera does have a better image quality, but both cameras give you a lot of settings in their menus that you can use to tweak the image to your lighting conditions and get it to look good in your environment. When you consider that this camera costs about the same as a Canon R800 and a UTAP video interface, and then how easily it is to add additional cameras to the system when you're ready to grow, and the fact that you don't need as beefy of a computer to stream with, I think this could be a great way for churches to get started in live streaming. Let me know in the comments below if you're going to take this approach. I know of one church already that's using RTSP cameras successfully in their live stream, and I'd love to hear how it goes for you. Until next time, bye.